launching his book Ocean State tonight. So round of applause for his latest achievement. <laughs> Apologies to Bill that I'm blocking right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, just a little bit about us and about the store and about what to expect from tonight. Hello to people on the live stream at home. Um, my apologies that it's not like my best work. <laughs> um, I'm missing a tripod and a microphone. So just holler at me if the audio is weird and I will do my best to adjust that. Uh, you can message me in the chat. Um, yeah, I am Anna. I'm the events director at Whitewell Bookstore. So for those of you who are visiting us for the first time or who are at home and not familiar with us or um, just want to know a little bit about us if you've been here a couple of times, uh, we are a family owned general interest independent store in the lovely Bloomfield neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Um, our Events programming features local, national, and international writers, translators, and um, yeah, authors of reading, discussing, and celebrating literature of all genres and for all ages. So we have a couple of events coming up that I just wanted to shout out in case you're interested. And we have the books for all of these in the store. So please let me know if um, Adley or I can direct you in the direction of the books. So um, this Friday, March 18th at 7 p.m. in the store, no live stream, my apologies for that. Uh, we are thrilled to help Nima Avashia launch her debut memoir, Another Appalachia, Coming Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place, which is out just a week or two ago from West Virginia University Press. And she'll be joining conversation by local author, Gita Katari, who is the author of I Break the Moose and who is uh, just one of our favorite people. So we're really thrilled about that event. We hope to see some of you back for that. Uh, and next Tuesday, March 22nd at 7 p.m., we are welcoming back Ed Simon, who uh, virtually, uh, who's the author of one of our bestsellers in alternative history of Pittsburgh. And this time he'll be launching his latest Pandemonium, which is a truly wild um, sort of art book, sort of history book. Uh, that's a visual history of demonology. So we have some copies on the front table uh, on the other side of the store. It just came out another week or two ago. Um, and I think we could open one of those up for you if you wanted to check it out, they're wrapped in plastic. So that's next Tuesday at 7 p.m. So I'm going to introduce um, Stuart and Bill and then I'll turn it over to the two and we'll start with um, some brief readings and then they'll engage in conversation. We'll have a little bit of time for q and I'll run the, run the mic around. And yeah, thank you again for being here. So. I have all these pages of praise for Ocean State, uh, which it deserves. I got to read a galley and it was fantastic. I ripped through it in a couple of days. Um, so Bill Lychek is the author of Cargo Falls, The Wasp Eater and The Architect of Flowers. And his work has appeared in the Best American Short Stories, The Pushcart Prize and on Public Radio's This American Life. He teaches at the University of Pittsburgh and directs their graduate writing program. And our man of the hour, Stuart O'Nan, is the author of 20 books, including Wish You Were Here, Everyday People, Emily Alone, Snow Angels, Songs for the Missing, and A Prayer for the Dying. His 2007 novel, Last Night at the Lobster, was a national bestseller and a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. He was born and raised in Pittsburgh, where he lives with his family. So I will turn it over to the two of them. Thank you all again. Thanks, thanks for coming out. Uh, I think the last time I was out was Friday the 13th, 2020. Uh, we went to the Wiggle uh, Whiskey, their brand new place. They had just opened. We went there that night and drank, ate, had a great time, went home and never left. <laughs> and now stayed home and had to do something. So if you make a novelist stay at home for a year, they're going to write a novel. So uh, my wife, Tree said, oh, everybody's book is coming out this spring. And I was like, yes, yes, that's how it works. Uh, actually, I should, I should give a shout out to uh, Susan Strait, one of my favorite, favorite authors, an LA author, really Riverside, California. Um, her book, Mecca, drops today too. So if you see it around the store, uh, yeah, definitely check it out, Mecca, Susan Strait. So anyway, just the very beginning.
When I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. She was in love, my mother said, like it was an excuse. She didn't know what she was doing. I had never been in love then, not really, so I didn't know what my mother meant, but I do now. This was in Ashaway, Rhode Island, outside Westerly, down along the shore. That fall, we lived in a house by the river, across the road from the mill where my grandmother had met my grandfather. The line and twine was closed, posted with rusty no trespassing signs, but just above the dam, someone had snipped a hole in the fence with bolt cutters so you could sneak in the back. We used to roller skate up and down the aisles between the dusty looms. My special talent. I was a late bloomer, she said, as if that was supposed to be comforting. What if I didn't have a special talent, I wanted to ask. What if a hopeless nerd was all I'd ever be? My mother's talent was finding new boyfriends and new places for us to live. She worked as a nurse's aide at the Elms, an old folks home in Westerly where my great aunt Mildred lived and didn't make any money. Fridays, she'd come home and change, brushing her hair out, making up her face, using too much perfume. She'd been a cheerleader and could dance. She dieted, but tried to. Facing the narrow mirror on her closet, she complained that nothing fit her anymore. I used to look like you, she told Angel, like a threat. And it was true. In her old pictures, they could have been twins. If she'd wanted to, she said, she could have married a doctor, but they were all assholes. Your father was sweet. We knew our father was sweet. What we didn't understand was when he'd become an asshole or why. My grandmother had never liked him because his family was Portuguese. He tricked my mother into turning Catholic and then abandoned her. Never trust a Portuguese, she said, like it was a joke. I had his dark hair and eyes, so what did that make me? My mother's boyfriends tried to be sweet, but they were strangers. Sometimes they paid our rent, and sometimes we split it. Say, dead sober, and a month later, she brought home another loser. They seemed to be getting younger and scruffier, which Angel thought was a bad sign. My mother didn't seem to notice. In the beginning, everything was new. She lost weight and kissed us too much and made promises she couldn't keep. The last had been a deckhand named Wes who brought home lobsters and called her Care and took us to Block Island to ride bikes until one night he smashed her phone when she tried to call the cops. Neither of them was bleeding, so the cops didn't charge anyone. You guys are useless, my mother said. Yeah, one of them said. That's why we're here at one in the morning, because we got nothing better to do. We were living in the top half of a duplex, and the next morning while Wes was out dragging There was moss on the shingles and weeds in the gutters. My grandmother came over to help us clean the kitchen. She brought her rubber gloves. It's not the Taj Mahal, she said. It's fine, my mother said, as if we wouldn't be there long. Angel Lynn, quit with the face. and like all children, had an overdeveloped sense of justice. I wanted everyone to be happy, despite our actual lives. Don't stop, just keep going. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Y
Every day she sat stern and impassable, dealing with kids in trouble. If we went to her, she'd know just by the looks on our faces, and she'd say, what's the matter? She'd stand and lead us to an empty classroom where we could be heroes. Yet with this raw weight and power in our hands, the fit of the gun so perfect, we must have no longer wished to be smart or nice anymore. We wanted to use the gun. We needed to shoot something. It was as plain and obvious and stupid as that. For whatever reason, it seemed a thing required. Two of us must have needed to make what everyone would think was the exact wrong decision. Otherwise, we'd have long since gone to Brownie's father at CLMP, Connecticut Light and Power. The two of us finding Mr. Brownell in one of the big maintenance stations, the man up to his elbows in some kind of engine or generator. We'd have approached all timid and shy, awed by this half dim cathedral of machinery. He'd be annoyed at first, interrupted at work, saying, this better be good. But then he'd have been so proud when we showed what we found, when he realized what we had done by coming to the hymn. Such an obvious triumph it would have been, though we must not have wanted to shine in any such way. Because we never went anywhere near the power company that afternoon, never went looking for him down at the Elks or the Knights of Columbus or wherever else he wound up this time of day. We didn't wait at the top of Addison Street. He would have arrived to us sooner or later, that rattle of utility truck in the dusk. Brownie's father coming home, pulling up to the curb, saying, what are you two numbnuts doing out here? So I'm going to skip out of my own stuff. Um, there's a pat. So what I love about Stuart's work is I, I can totally feel it and see it. And I know the work life that these people have. I know the, the, I know the kind of cars they drive. I just, not in an envious way, but in a sort of, like you do feel like certain envy and writers. Like I say, oh, that jerk wrote that book before I did. But I feel, I feel it more like an aspirational thing that he nails something that is not within my ken, but is appreciated by my ken, if that makes sense. Um, so there are two passages, and I love the way that I think they link up throughout the book, and there are a bunch of linkages. This is from Last Night at the Lobster, which my students love. I teach at the university, and they just love this book to death. But it's short. It's very short, <laughs> right? That's a huge plus. That is, this is my not too long either. Um, and as you can see, there's a theme. Um, yes, they're it's a pleasant. Okay, smaller and smaller. As, as they have to. Um, so it'll be weird maybe re reading your work, but I don't care. I don't want to do it. Um, it'll be weird for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is, I'm just dropping you in. You don't need to know anything. So just we're just in a, in a moment together with the characters. The stock, and you have, I think, in, again, in terms of like small town, if we're back to um, Stuart's directive for the night, back to that small town life. Um, the stock room isn't a room at all, but a hallway behind the grill that shell with shelves on each side rising to the ceiling. The transformer-like hum of the ice maker and the cyclic rinsing, cyclic? Cyclic. Cyclic rinsing, I can get, I can actually ask the person who wrote it. <laughs> the cyclic rinsing of the dishwasher. She kissed him here a dozen times. Still thinks really, but there they are, solid evidence. The glasses too, even though they were supposed to be a limited offer, what isn't? He needs to remember that with Dina. And this next paragraph, it happens maybe 
70 pages later, but it could have to be the next paragraph in my view. Um, following along, blinking and sniffing, shuffling up, shuffling to keep up, he thinks that may have that may have been why he fell for Jackin. Losing his grandmother and the only home he'd known, he needed something to cling to. But then, why not Dina? Why not Dina now? That's the question he can't answer, just as he can't say exactly what he feels for her or what, fu what future they may have together. And he thinks with a sudden weariness that he doesn't love her enough and probably never will and that later they'll both have to pay for this fault of his, more than he and Jacqueline already have. Not bad. Well done. <laughs> now, we'll take this. Yeah. And Bill, I think you have questions for me? Or just, <laughs> oh, just going to grill me? Yeah. Okay, grilling, grilling is good. It fits with a lobster. Happy question. I don't know if I have questions, but I, I do have curiosities, topics. Um, so I have things that are important to me when I write this kind of book. Um, I think of it as an honoring and a betraying at the same time, in a way. Um, do you think of a fidelity to a certain person or people? when you're writing small town story. I mean, I would think all of your stories. I don't even think just this book in particular. Uh, well, well, yeah, there has to be some, some loyalty to the place and the people that are actually from the place there. Um, but in this case, I'm writing about places that I never was. Whereas you're writing from the old hometown, you're writing from yeah. memory. Yeah. Um, in, in these, especially these two books, I'm writing away from myself into something else, in, into areas that I, I'm not from, but I can then learn while I'm writing. I think I listened to, to Bill Evans um, and Marion McPartland today on a, a program they did back in 1978. And I think it was uh, Bill Evans says that improvisation uh, has to go out ahead of knowledge, but it can't be out there all by itself. So what I'm trying to do usually when I'm writing is I'm trying to be live and in the moment and not work with notes or anything like that. But once I get down to a certain direction, start moving, then my knowledge has to catch up to that. And so I have to learn more about these places, yeah. um, especially a place like the lobster, um, which I've never worked in a red lobster. So I had to go to actual managers of red lobsters and say, what do you have to do? How do you manage a red lobster in a regular day? What do you have to do? Um, and they're shocked that someone would even bother to ask them um, and take them seriously. And so I, I got to learn. In the situation. So I have to kind of go outside of myself and learn about this area and then attach it to the character. And I have to know it as well as the character knows it, mm -hmm. which is the real key here. And in terms of Manny, he knows everything about this place. So I have to know everything about this place. Luckily, it's a red lobster, so I can learn. There are people there that can teach me. But if I'm doing a place like, say, Vietnam and being a combat medic in Vietnam, no way. And I'm never going to learn that. So the thing I'll do is I'll throw a character in there who is absolutely green. He's never done it before. So he has to learn it. So as he's learning it, I'm learning it at the same time. And that's the kind of fidelity. So I can understand all the emotions that Manny is having. I can understand all the emotions that Marie and Carol and Angel and Bertie have there. Their exterior facts, I have to learn. 
but their interior truth, I have to already feel that or be able to feel that. And feel a need to express. And, and feel a need to express. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like what definitely. Skin in the game sort of thing, what, what you care about. Yeah, well, that, I mean, I'm going to put in front of the reader things that I care about that I feel maybe a lot of other writers don't really care about at all. Mm -hmm. What's important to put in front of the reader? What do you want the world to pay attention to? Um, and typically I, I choose things that the rest of the world doesn't really care a whole lot about. Um, when I, when I returned, uh, the manuscript of last night of the lobster to my agent, he said, who cares about a red lobster? And I was like, oh shit, that's, <laughs> that's not what you want your agent to say about your book at all. Um, and I, I wasn't quite sure because I cared about the red lobster because Manny cared about the red lobster. Um, he, he took it seriously. This was, in a way, his life's work up to that point. Um, so I think if you have a character who really cares about something, that the, the reader will usually go along with that and, and try to understand why they care about it so much and what it means to them that they're losing it. Um, I think that's the same here in Ocean State. We, we care about what Marie cares about and a little bit about what Birdie and Carol and, and Angel care about, even though they make sometimes terrible choices. And all your work seems, and, and especially Lobster, but Ocean State, what I read of it, it it's involved with the day-to-day -day work, the day, I mean, that that becomes a backbone of like, you really structure a, a story around the working life. The, that's another thing I, people in their books, in your books tend to, I think, dislike their jobs immensely, but need them immensely, um, if that makes sense. It's like, there's a, there's a, a give and take that is really, I think, affecting to me. Um, well, the, the question is, how does time move for us? Uh, how, how do you how do you count out? You know, do you count it in hours? Do you count it in days? Do you count it in work weeks? Do you count it in semesters? How, what's the natural container for your days? And when I look at these characters, it's the the, the women, the young women, are in school. So their school day, I mean, the weekdays are, are taken up and then they have part-time jobs after it. How much time is really their own and what can they actually do with it? So it's a question of inevitabilities. I mean, and Carol works at a nursing home full time. So she has to be there. She has to work with these people. Um, but this mic is killing me. Uh, um, yeah, so again, how, how does time move for your characters? And I think a lot about that because that then becomes the rhythm of the book. Um, and sometimes as in, in Last Night the Lobster becomes the container for the book and the natural clock within that book. Yeah. And I didn't mean to steer this all toward lobster because we want to talk about Ocean State. Um, when we're talking about vantage point, and that's a similar thing, like where do you set your narrative camera? Do you think about that before you start a book or as it evolves? Or I know this, and Mason put, pointed this out in his review today, um, which was a great review if you have. But that it's all it's told from a female points of view. So long, see you tomorrow. Was at heart going to have this very cold and terrible thing, you know? At the, at the very center of it, so that I wanted to bring in more warmth. To carry it and to hold on to for her whole life. I said, oh, you know, that, that's kind of perfect because she is that that what they call the recording angel, right? She observes everything. She takes everything down because she, she's not in the molten heart of it where things get confusing and you can't really examine your choices. So I knew it was going to be Marie, but also it was going to be Marie in retrospect. I wanted that that feeling as in Cargo Falls that it's too late. You can't change these things. You can only look at them now and try to analyze them, try to figure out why did this happen? You know, why did this have to happen this particular way? Because Marie doesn't understand. She'll never understand. 
Um, the same thing with, with Arthur and Snow Angels, or I think the William Maxwell figure in So Long and See You Tomorrow. He can try, right? He, he, can, he can play games with that anthill as much as he wants to, uh, but he'll never quite... wise voice right up front so you're not building up to some sort of big reveal where the wisdom all of a sudden comes but the wisdom is already in the first sentence in a lot of ways like we know that it's going to end with killing um and something in your book something horrible is going to happen same with maxwell like we know not only from his other work that his mother's going to die but there's a pistol shot it's the first sentence um but yeah oh it's a, it's a cheap hook it's a cheap hook too it's like stay tuned something awful is going to happen you know? you're going to see it <laughs> but it's also important in terms of like not again not bringing that wise voice to page 120 but having that wise voice from what does a character know from the start of the story and not to be coy with our information as you reveal it yeah yeah definitely and 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 also that that ability of your first person narrator not just to narrate but to analyze um and so it, it, it the story is somewhat pre-digested and pre-selected um, and, and you can also play around with that in a very fun way in that by convention, in a way, we think that it's possible that Marie, in fact, has chosen what's going to be shown in the third person sections as well. Um, and so you can map onto that and say, how is Marie shown in her first person sections versus her third person sections? What can she admit in the third person where she can hide behind a character Marie versus You're um, like putting it outside yourself gives you a certain distance from it that you can dive into that world. Um, do you have fun working? Is it, is it, well, I mean, yeah, because otherwise I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I, you know, I've been doing this now since I was, was talking with, uh, I think it was Bob Hoover. I've been doing this since 1984. So yeah, obviously I must like it. Otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't torture myself. But you, you often don't know. You don't know what you've got. of it that that's really pleasing you say oh I, I didn't see that solution at all there and now seven months in i'm like oh i see how it goes together that that's a lot of fun it, it's it, it appeals to the the engineer in me when i see things kind of go together and say oh that's why i exactly where um, it emerges over time you're saying i mean it, it, these connections emerge you, you're you're following your sort of nose and, and working it out but then the connections sort of come overnight it seems at sometimes and, and they click and we're going to be walking down the street and be like oh i need that i'm going to put that right in there yeah. I, I can see the i can see exactly where that needs to go yeah um and sometimes it, it does fit there and sometimes it doesn't fit there sometimes you see these things really really late Sometimes you find out about them even after the book has come out. They're like, oh, that's why that's there. Oh, now I understand. <laughs> um, yeah, I was doing a, a, a podcast with somebody the other day, and they, they, point, they pointed out at the, at, the, at the very end that that Marie, by the end of the book, seems to be going back in time. She seems to be going back you know, through the generations. And in the end, she ends up wearing her grandfather's coat and, and doing all this sort of 19th century stuff. And I was like, oh, huh. <laughs> Didn't even notice that. I just, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's why. Um, but a lot of that, you know, it's, it's serendipitous, and you hope, you hope for those accidents to actually, you know, pay off in a way and chime in a way. And sometimes they do, um, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes you're you're forcing them, 
and and you have to sort of take them out or break them apart. Or, you know, you can't be too too matchy matchy. Well, it can't read itself too early. The story itself, like you need it to be. Oh, oh, I, I had all all sorts of problems that early on when I was writing of giving away stuff way too early. You know, when people say, "Oh, you're giving it away here in the first sentence of the book," but before I'd have major events and suddenly they pop up in chapter three of like a 20 chapter book. And I'd be like, oh, it's too early. I know I gotta pull that out and put it somewhere else. Um, but you're always thinking, I'm always thinking at least scene, pacing, proportion. Do I have enough of this in here? Do I have enough of this character in here? Am, am I skimping on this character? Have I gone through this too quickly? Um, I, I want, I want, I, Laurie Moore was my teacher and she said, start big, finish big, set your big scenes big, and in the middle, go as deep as you can. And I, I've always had trouble with saying, is this a big scene? Is this a small scene? What, what, what proportion do I need here? Because um, sometimes I'll attack, and you'll see it in the books, sometimes I'll attack a novel with the tools of the short story. And then, then it becomes a little too elusive and then too spare, and I'll need to bulk a scene up. Like, like in um, Last Night the Lobster, my editor at the time, Josh Kendall, um, he said, you've got six scenes between Manny and Jackie. They're the, they're the main heart of this book. They are the couple of this book. You have six scenes with them. None of those scenes is longer than two pages. I need more. And I was like, ah, oh, shit, he's right. He's absolutely right. And this is after... You know, I mean, we're well into the editing process. We're almost in the publishing process now. And I was like, God damn it, he's right. I got to go in there. I got to bulk it. I got to make those things bigger. Get, get that proportion right there. What what can Manny say to her? What can't Manny say to her? What can Jackie say to him? What would Jackie really say to him? And, and some of the best stuff in that book came from that advice. But I didn't see it at all. I needed his fresh eyes to see it. In, in your, are there questions you want to be asked in terms of like your process or no. what? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it, most, it mostly consists of sitting my ass on a chair. Sir once described his process to my class and it, it, he, has, he adopted this, this posture. Your posture was terrible in this story. It's like this. It's like just pecking away like a sense of yeah, Most of it's like this. <laughs> what's what's the next sentence what's the next scene what's the next word why is this word wrong yeah. and, uh, what is this character really going to do I don't know I got to sit there and wait and kind of find out <laughs> and it, it just takes time That's great. Uh, but uh, you know the job I mean uh, you sit <laughs> there and, and for me if I'm not sitting there it's not going to come I'm not going to go off and, and play softball Suddenly, it's going to just come to mind. It doesn't work that way for me. I don't. I don't write in my head. I got to put it on paper, push it around, mess around, sling some ink on it, um, yellow pad it, um, napkins, post-it notes, backs of tickets, anything, um, and then sort of gather it all together. And, and an amazing amount of material, just paper material, goes into it. I think I'm old school that way. I still keep big um, loose leaf notebooks. You know, like that thick. I'll have like ten of them for like a two hundred page book. So it's all it's always about for me absorbing this giant mass of stuff and then boiling it down and getting it into again the emotions of the characters. It all has to come through point of view, and point of view for me is always emotion. And what got you to Rhode Island and Ocean State? Uh, well, the murder that it's actually based on was set in Connecticut. It, it, it happened in Connecticut in the town of Haddam, if you know it, uh, down the Connecticut River, one of these old river towns. It used to be like a seafaring harbor where whalers actually lived. Um, and it was just a, a scruffy, ugly, ugly murder case of this 13-year-old girl named Marianne Measles, um, who wanted so badly to be part of this group that her way in was to sleep with the boys in the group. But the girls from the group didn't like that, and so they convinced the boys to murder her. And so together, the boys and the girls murdered her, shoved her in an oil drum, and threw her off a bridge into the river. Um, 
And I was like, oh, Jesus, what a horrible, terrible thing. You know, it kind of haunted me. You know, what, what, you know, your 13 year old this happens to. And there was all this press about the family, and the mother was a single mother, and they moved all the time, and she had all these terrible boyfriends. There was heroin involved. It was just, it was just a mess. It was, it was this bad, scrappy, ugly, gritty mess in this shit ass little river town um, in the most prosperous state and the most prosperous country in the world. And I thought, you know, how do I write about this? How do I find my way into this? Um, and it took me a long, long time to find the sister. Um, and I was like, well, well, how does the sister see this? And what if Marianne is actually a little older and the younger sister sees Marianne as a model, has always seen Marianne as the model. This is how I should behave. This is what love is. This is, you know, this is the way to be. And then this happens. What, what do you do with it? How do you go on? How do you endure that? What are the consequences of that? So I started thinking about all the people that, that were involved in it. Who does it mean the most to? Who cares the most? That's always your point of view character. Who cares the most when you're looking for that character? And I thought, oh, it's got to be the younger sister. It's going to be you know, Marianne or Angel herself. It's going to be the mother, obviously, and one of the other girls there, the, the girl that kills or the girl that decides that she has to die. And I thought, okay, those are my four mains. How do I do this? How do I put this all together? Um, and I just started thinking about small town, New England novels, first person retrospective narrator. And the one that immediately popped out to me was Shirley Jackson, We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which is this very weird sisterly relationship between the younger sister, Mary Katz, um, and the older sister, who is the model for how we live in the world. And that's what success is. That is that's what being a person is. That is what being a woman is. And so once I found Mary Cat, I thought about the sister Marie. I said, okay, first person, let's go and let's see what happens. I had the first line. The first line was, that summer we lived in a house by the river, which is almost a gloss on Hemingway, Farewell to Arms, which I was like, okay, but I like the rhythm of it. Now that summer we lived in a house by the river. And I just started thinking about that house and the two sisters, and how the rest of the town sees them. Um, and, and they kind of hide from the rest of the town. The rest of the town thinks that they're poor and dirty and awful and, and all that. And they just started thinking about how that warps you, that the way that small towns see you, there's no hiding. You can't hide as you can hide in a city at all. Um, and from there, I just tried to find another way in there. And that's when I picked up Cardinal Falls. And, so long CDMR and I thought about what I'd done in Snow Angels and how is this going to be different rather than just, you know, changing my main characters. dangers of love. I mean, it's, it's the super cautionary tale, I think. Um, as, as understood by the sister. Yes, as understood by the sister, definitely. But also the way that I think Bertie um, and Angel approach the idea of uh, romance as a, a test of their own work. Mm. When you put too much of your own work into that romantic relationship and then it falls apart, what are you left with? Um, I have one last question. Um, or maybe if, pe if people want to ask questions too, it's a great time to jump in. I'd love to, I'm sure Stuart would love to answer questions from you too. Um, you have a great way of never condescending to your characters in my view. And I wonder if there are certain things that you, you think about as you're composing stories or as them and anyway, we want to jump into that that other body that other person and find out what it feels like to be in love um, to be betrayed to lose that love um, to be so sort of caught up in rage that you do these terrible things um, and i just want to make sure that i can leave enough room for the reader to be able to get in there and, and feel that without me sort of getting in the way and saying look look at my beautiful writing you know i know all these adjectives 
Um, you know, look at this lighting effect. Isn't it great? Um, I just want kind of clarity. I want from, from the, the prose surface, I just want clarity um, and maybe a little bit of speed, I think. And that comes also with the editing and, and the idea of pacing and proportion. But I want people to be there with the characters and to care about what they're going through, even if sometimes it's kind of tough or even harrowing, I think. But I think that's what we come to fiction for, to find out how it feels to be this other person, which we don't do in most of our other arts. I think. Stuart, was it easier or, or harder writing in a, in a place that you don't know? I would think in a certain way, writing about a place you would do know might be harder because you, maybe you're imprisoned to some degree by your real, your actual reality and, and, and you know truth or your experience. Yeah, I mean, it, it varies, I think. I mean, you're always going to be selective and you're only going to be showing like one little sliver of, of wherever you're, you're writing about there. But what you're looking for, I think, for me in setting is that, that feeling of how are the characters connected to it? What does it mean to them? Um, and, and how does it feel to them? Because somebody else going to the, the town of Ashaway could find it a, a charming New England village. Um, they could. Um, or, or they're going to see the beach in a different way because it's all tied in with point of view. When, when Birdie drives down to the beach to meet with Miles there, she's seeing it because her, her emotions are so high up here. Um, she's, she's magnetized. She's that energized point of view character. So her detail work there is going to reflect what's going on inside her. So it'd be totally different for any other character. Um, so I'm going to pick just what I need from that. Um, so I may have all these choices. But for Birdie, the only choices that are going to make sense are going to be sort of this, 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 and that. And that's enough to show her, her state of mind. You also once said in one of my classes, I, and I remember it, um, every single, every last detail in a story has to reveal character at some level. So like even those characters, those, how she sees the beach front and the water that day has to be somehow revelatory of the character itself. In terms of detail work, Every detail that's in there has to somehow impinge upon the character's true desire, whether the character knows their own true desire or not there. And in that, it does reveal them. And, that, and that's one way of getting rid of all that, that, that dross, that chaff that people will throw in there as setting. Oh, I need two more sentences about setting. Well, no, you don't. You just need the setting that is seen through your character's eyes and means something to them. I can see that. Okay, um, Stuart, um, most of your books uh, contain characters you created, but in the one book, what, Beyond Sunset, you dealt with actual people, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Zelda, and Sheila Graham. Did that really limit you as to how you can talk about their emotions and talk about their thoughts? Uh, were you restrained? Yeah, in, in West of Sunset, which is about F. Scott Fitzgerald's last years when he's living in Hollywood and, and writing screenplays, my point of view character there, it's a third person subjective, so it's sort, sort of third person limited. Everything is kind of through Scott in a way, using his sensibility, but not using his language because practically he's such a better writer than I am that I couldn't do it. So that, that would be a losing game. But yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be tied to his point of view. Everything that he feels um, is going to come out when he sees characters like Humphrey Bogart or Dorothy Parker or, or Zelda Fitzgerald. Um, but in fact, in, in that book, um, I, I'd read a short story somewhere that was based on Cheers, where the writer was using the characters from Cheers to write his own short story. And he, he basically took off from these characters. So those characters were already sort of, we already had them. They're already built into us. And he could then sort of improvise on top of that and take us further. And that was the idea in West of Sunset, to take those characters further. You already have a built-in view of who is Dorothy Parker? What does Dorothy Parker do? And so I don't have to sketch that in at all. I don't have to even have an establishing shot. I roll Dorothy Parker out there on the stage and we know she's going to be smart. She's going to be witty. She's going to be urbane. She's going to be East Coast. Um, and so I can, I can sort of even out Dorothy Parker, Dorothy Parker. 
Um, and I can, I can slam these characters together in a way that they were together in real life. Like Humphrey Bogart lived in the Garden of Allah at the same time that Fitzgerald did. Did they hang out together? Maybe, I don't know. But I can write those scenes where they're partying out by the pool and they're drinking together. Um, I can write those scenes now where Dorothy Parker and F. Scott Fitzgerald can dance underneath the palm trees, you know, in the middle of the night, totally hammered in Hollywood. Those are the scenes I want. Those are the scenes that I'm not getting from the biographies. So I can speculate on top of what we actually already know, but haven't been actually satisfied. So I'd read the biographies and I'm like, where's the juice? Where's the life? You know, where's, where are the relationships? They're just not there because they're seen from, you know, satellite distance. Whereas in our fiction, we can get right up close. And so when they're dancing together, we can hear what they're whispering to each other, which is what we want to hear right? They had an affair in New York years before, and here they are out in Hollywood together. Zelda's out of the picture. You know, Alan, her husband, is semi out of the picture. What's happening? What's going on? Um, that's what I really want to know there. So I took a lot of liberties there. But again, they were all posited on stuff that was already there in the record. So it was actually a lot more fun there. I got to do a lot more things, and, and I got to push the language a lot because these are people that had great, great skills and they were very, very funny um, and very erudite, which my characters are, are not always. So I have to do a lot more of that. It's a lot more fun. It's like fan fiction goes pro. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for just one more. Unless you want to take one or two more. Or... Oh, two more. Okay, okay, cool. I was sort of interested in your vision process. Um, when you finish something and you go back to, to like sort of start the revision, how much of that do you feel comfortable coming from you that you can look at it with fresh eyes and how much comes through agents and editors and other maybe people that you trust to give you feedback? Yeah, really good question. Um, how much do I trust my own eyes after saying, Of about 10 readers. Um, and, and at the end of each book in the acknowledgement section, there's a list of them there. And you can see who has vetted the book, especially in that, that first read. Um, they'll come back with their criticisms, um, their suggestions, and I'll, I'll go through them and look for some sort of consensus or blind spots. If they find something that I've just totally ignored or missed, um, I'll, I'll take their word for it. I have certain people that are really good at language and metaphor. So if they if they have a question mark or an X through one of my metaphors, it's gone, it's out of there. Um, I have people that are really good with structure. Uh, Paul Cody, one of my, my friends from Cornell, he's brilliant at structure. If I've forgotten a character for more than 20 pages, he'll nail it. Okay, what happened to, you know, what happened to Eddie? Where'd he go? Um, um, so I'll, I'll take their, their criticism seriously because they've read thousands of my pages there. Then after that revision, I'll, I'll pretty, pretty much take it to a second set as well, if I'm still not quite sure. And that second set of readers will come back and they'll usually have more of a consensus. That's when I'll send it out to my agent who used to be the editor in chief of Doubleday and was also a poet. Um, and he'll have his take on it and then he'll send it to the editor. In this case, it's Sarah Vitale at Grove Atlantic and she'll have her take on it as well. My goal is that by the time it gets to that editor that I pretty much know what I have and what I want to sort of do more of or less of. And then I'll see if what I think about it matches up with her view of it. Yeah. Um, some editors want to make a lot of changes. Some editors are kind of hands off. Some editors think they have to make a lot of changes and you have to kind of look out for them. Some editors have wonderful ears. Um, they have beautiful ears. Some people have tin ears. So you have to look out for that. I, I, had, I had one guy who was just had a terrible tin ear and would try to change my sentences. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what you're here for. You do other things really well. So, so yeah, but, but even in the end, you, don't, you can't fix everything. And sometimes you, you, you do as much as you can. And the book's still not any good. I mean, it's not supposed to be easy. There's no one who wrote nothing except good books. Um, I think Alice Monroe probably comes the closest. Um, but, but 
sometimes you have to write the crappy ones to get to the good ones, I guess. I'm, I'm more of the, the Joyce Carol Oates school, I think, than, than, the, than, than the William H. Gass school. I'm not gonna spend 30 years, you know, adding things and making this big literary doorstop. It's not gonna happen, I think. So, but it's a good question. Thanks, and one more. So I'm teaching a fiction workshop this semester. And one of the real threshold concepts that my students can't quite get through is writing imperfect characters or characters that make decisions that maybe we wouldn't agree with or we wouldn't do ourselves. And you do that so well. And so do you have any unsolicited advice to novice writers on how to embrace an imperfect character or make an imperfect character? Yeah, the character is always smart and always right, and the rest of society is totally wrong, and they, they know better than anybody else, and, you know, they're going to be proven right at the end. Uh, challenge your character. Let the circumstances that they're in challenge the character, and let them find out that they're not right about everything. You know, knock them down. Uh, Dennis Lehane says of characters like that in situations like that, let the bad thing happen, right? Let the bad thing happen. Uh, I think... Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So punch your character in the face and see how they bounce back. Or Jonathan Franzen is just mean to his characters. He does these terrible things to them. So you as a reader want to protect them from him, which I think is a really interesting strategy there. So yeah, punch him in the face. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Is willing to personalize if you come say hi. Thank you.